And so now I'd like to welcome back on the stage Anish Agarwal, who's going to take us through a retail panel where we're going to look at what the consumers are thinking. Anish, over to you. Thanks a lot, Martin, again, and I hope you all had a great break. Time is short, so we're going to dive straight into the second session as we head downstream. Everybody here knows that their future depends on consumers buying diamond jewelry. But here's a challenge. Nobody needs diamonds. They don't serve any functional purpose. People buy diamonds because of the emotional value it brings to them because of what it symbolizes. That sort of sounds scary, I guess, but we shouldn't be scared by this. There are lots of products that sell on emotion. Handbags, watches, these are very successful categories. Sometimes people close to me try to persuade me that it's totally worth spending thousands of dollars just to be able to carry your possessions around. But the trouble with these types of products that sell on emotion, these discretionary products, is this. If you don't stay emotionally relevant to the consumer, it can have serious consequences. And that's especially true now when we are confronted with a range of new factors, especially now. Let's talk about retail. I think it's fair to say that if we look at retail in our industry, we've failed to modernize and innovate historically compared to other luxury sectors. And this is a big issue for our sector because diamond jewelry retailers play such an important role in educating the consumer, getting them over the line. COVID was a big wake-up call for retailers everywhere. Weak players went out of business, but there was an upside. It catalyzed a move towards retailers developing an omni-channel approach to selling to consumers. This isn't just about getting online. Sure, we've seen some physical stores set up a digital presence, but we've also seen it go the other way around. Blue Nile has set up showrooms. In the end, it's about taking all these different channels, taking all the information and insight you can get from them and giving the best possible consumer experience. So retail has shaken up, but there's an even bigger revolution going on at consumer level. We're confronted with Gen Z, the next wave in our consumer cycle, and they're much more socially conscious. The issue around generational change is it's not about passing the baton from one group of people to another. It's about a shift in values in the way all of us think. Right now, Gen Z don't have a big share of the diamond wallet, but they've got a disproportionate voice in shaping how all of us think and even how our culture is defined today. Sustainability has become a big thing. We've got to the stage where sustainability is becoming part of almost any business conversation we have. It's become a broad catch-all term for a diverse set of topics. The environment, gender and racial equality and empowerment, ethical values. And it's challenging governments and industries everywhere. It's going to have a real impact as to how consumers, retailers, and especially the media relate to our diamond jewelry product. Now, there's a widespread view that many of us have, and it's easy to be sympathetic with, which is consumers talk a lot about sustainability, but when it comes to buying something, they forget their thoughts about sustainability. All that talk about sustainability goes out of the window. The booming fast fashion industry shows this could be true. There's even a case to be made that sustainability should be a lower priority when it comes to diamonds. For one thing, people don't buy diamonds very often. And when they do, it's actually got a lower environmental impact compared to other choices they would make. The carbon footprint of the engagement ring you buy is going to pale into insignificance compared to the plane journey you make on the way to the honeymoon. But well, we know that isn't the full picture because different rules apply to different products depending on why you buy them and what they symbolize. In the case of diamonds, there are different rules because diamonds symbolize 
our biggest aspirations. They symbolize our biggest emotional commitments and investments. So there's a change in the consumer dynamic. How is it going to affect the way they connect to diamond jewelry? And how does it feed into the debate around lab-grown diamonds? Diamonds are a luxury product. And luxury is dominated by prestige houses who do most of the marketing and drive most of the desire. In the past, sustainability, mention of sustainability was buried somewhere in a marketing campaign. Now it's become a core brand value. Hermes, a brand that has built its heritage on leather, has started to experiment with mushroom-based alternatives. Chanel has stopped using all its exotic skins, which were the basis of its most expensive handbags. Pretty much every prestige house has stopped using fur or is in the process of doing so. What these brands think about lab-grown diamonds is going to be crucial. And they might be more open-minded in private than they're willing to say in public. But a barrier could be this. Can a lab-grown diamond even be luxury and aspirational if it's cheap? Culturally, as consumers, we are conditioned to equate expensive with better. The financial pain of buying a diamond is what makes it so prized to begin with. Lab-grown diamonds mess with this psychology. Can you really get the same buzz for buying something that's a fraction of the price? But on the other hand, everybody here knows this. No one wants to feel ripped off. No one wants to be a sucker. No one wants to spend two, three, four times the money on something that is physically identical. It's only the origin that sets a lab-grown diamond and a natural diamond apart. The trouble is that as an industry, we have marketed based on emotion and symbolism. Origin hasn't been part, historically, of our marketing history. Did we leave the door wide open for lab-grown to come in and leverage all the diamond equity that we built over decades? And it gets a lot more complicated when lab-grown and natural are offered side by side, described using the same four Cs, They've got a gem lab certificate, same format, same lab. Their address, they're sold in the same store at the same address, in the same jewelry settings. Where does origin even fit into this? So we've got a complex set of issues here. The change in retail, the change in generation, the focus on sustainability and how consumers really relate to that, and the interplay with that and lab-grown diamonds. In the end, it's going to be consumers that determine where this all goes. Consumers are millions, if not billions, of diverse individuals across the planet. And it's easy for many of us in this room to feel disconnected from consumers. Many of us don't sell directly to them. The role of connecting with consumers falls on retailers. And that's why what we're going to do in this next session is talk to retailers. It is our great pleasure to introduce on stage Beryl Raff, CEO of Helzberg Diamonds, one of the largest retailers in the US. Shamlal Ahmed, who's CEO of Muller Bar Gold and Diamonds, who are one of the fastest growing retailers in India. And Stephen Lucier, Executive Vice President of Brands and Consumer at De Beers, and has probably overseen more consumer research than anyone else in our industry. I'd like to welcome you all up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We're excited to have you. Welcome to Dubai. Thank you. No. Beryl, we want to jump in straight with you. What I'd just like to ask you is there have been some sound issues from our last session. So if you can talk quite close to the mic, apparently it's advisable. OK, well, we, try it. <laughs> we know it's all about the consumer. Beryl, I wanted to start with you as one of the largest retailers in America and, and arguably the world. When a consumer comes into the store, at one of your stores, how has the conversation changed over the last couple of years during COVID? 
during COVID's been an interesting period. The consumer, when they walk in the door, they are moderately educated. They believe they are very educated, but they are moderately educated uh, from what they've seen on the internet. You know, what, and social influence is very big, the whole viral impact. So they have a lot of questions, you know, be it a lab diamond or be it a mine diamond, they have lots of questions about the product. Yeah, and then we, we look at the fifth C we define as the C of choice. <clears throat> we clearly are retailers of lab diamonds and we show them both mind and lab. We explain, you know, we answer their questions. Uh, we don't make decisions for them. They're, they're, they're the boss you know, and, and that's how we handle. How Thanks a lot, Beryl. And, and you've talked about lab growing diamonds. I wanna park that for now. We will talk about that. Mm -hmm. In the first part of this discussion, we really want to focus on consumers. So the, the fact that the consumer conversation is changing. Shamlal, from an Indian perspective, you cover a completely different dynamic. How are consumers changing? Uh, how have they changed in the last two years? So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to this conference on behalf of Malabar Golden Diamonds. Jewelry usage in India, it's connected to a lot of our traditional and cultural values. We have a recorded usage of more than 5,000 years of jewelry usage in our country. There are a lot of emotion and culture attached to jewelry shopping in India. One of the biggest market in India is wedding. As all of us know, bridal jewelry is the biggest trousseau during a wedding. So demand, okay, you know, the market size of India as well. It is, we are about 65, 70 billion US dollar jewelry market in India, and it is growing six to seven percentage every year. There's a huge shift happening towards diamond and stated category in India, especially uh, during uh, post-COVID, we have seen, you know, a lot of revenge spending due to the lot of revenge spending happening in India, huge demand for luxury goods, especially in diamond category. Okay. And uh, uh, there's a proposal, there's a proposal trend happening in India like West. During the proposal, the millennials and Gen Z prefer to give half carat plus diamonds as a proposal ring or an engagement ring in India. And whatever occasions today, whether it is Valentine's Day, anniversaries, anniversaries is a big market in India today especially milestone anniversaries, whether it is fifth or 10th anniversary, people prefer to give bigger stones in India. So the demand for diamond jewelry is tremendously increasing in India. There's a shift happening towards plain gold jewelry to diamond category in India. That's a really big dynamic change from gold towards diamonds. We'll come back to that. Stephen, I wanna ask you, you've done a good deal of research on evolving consumer trends. What new opportunities has COVID created for diamonds? Do you know, it's been an extraordinary two years. And um, I think some of these changes we've seen are temporary, you spoke a little bit about, but I think some of them are permanent changes. And if I had to, I guess, pick a few out, I'll talk a little bit longer about the third, but, but certainly the importance of celebrating relationships has heightened during the COVID experience. And I laugh a little bit. I think it's in part a result of the lockdown. And to be honest, you either broke up, got divorced, or reinforced your, your relationship. And we've seen that in more weddings, but also I think we've seen that amongst uh, married couples who have been uh, you know, busy in their lives, suddenly thrown back together for hour after hour. And a re result of that, they've actually had more appreciation for each other. And I think that's why sales of, of jewelry, which, is, which has always been the best way to, um, uh, to show affection and emotion and commitment, have accelerated above other product categories. Because there is that sense of, you know, deep down in this strange world where nothing is predictable, our relationship is, is a, a rock to me and the ones that survived got celebrated. So that was a trend. The other trend, I've, and, and I think this is true of the, of the more affluent end of our, our market, 
is that COVID created this sense of who knows what's going to happen in the future. So we better get on with, with doing what we want to do now. And that's led to, I think, not, that's not only for jewelry, but we've seen that across the luxury goods uh, field in general, where people have been willing to make big expenditures at a time when you think, wow, that's so strange to make a big expenditure in a time when some things are so unpredictable, but it's a consequence of that. If I don't buy it now, who knows what's gonna happen to me in four years. You know, we've seen Rolls-Royce sales rocket. You think Rolls-Royce sales rocket during the pandemic? People are saying, buy it now, because I may not get the chance later. And so that has been, the, I think, on the affluent. But to me, the biggest change by far that's gonna be the most enduring, and you've touched on it a little bit in your introduction, um, is around uh, the way in which people buy things that impact some of the problems we have in the world. So, you know, during the recession in, the, in uh, you know, a decade ago, um, we saw climate change go off the agenda. Economics dominated it. I remember before that, like 2007, I was going to buy a hybrid car. I stopped worrying about any of that stuff. I just wanted to get through the economics of it. It's not true this time, huh? and because I think this, this crisis um, helped people to see that they live in an interconnected world. You know, the COVID maybe started in China, but it went everywhere, and you couldn't, you couldn't isolate yourself from, from it. And we live in this interconnected world. And I think when it comes to particularly climate change, but not only that, this sense of we're all in it together now has become uh, uh, more, more permanent. And I think where we get a little bit wrong when we discuss this is we always discuss it very rationally. We discuss it like sustainability and environmental impact and you know, we look at all the details. To me, that the research is telling me something a little bit different is that most consumers don't get into all the detail. But what they want to feel they want to feel that the way in which they're uh, uh, projecting their image, and brands project image, let's be, you know, that's what they do. Diamonds project image, uh, as well as satisfy the internal emotional needs of consumers. So when you're projecting an image, you have to say, what image do you want to project? And you want to project, I think, increasingly, that the things you're doing meet the values of the era that we're in. And I think yeah. that's where we're, that's where we're going to see the lasting impact from this. Stephen, you've definitely made my job easier by giving a wealth of topics to, to talk about. You talked about the issue of relationship permanence, the idea of focusing on that. You talked about the issue of, of living in the now and spending money. And you talked a little bit about the issue of looking at world impact. When COVID started, in fact, Stephen was one of the people who I think was the first to say, at least the one that I heard, amongst the people I heard, was that we're going to benefit from the lack of experiential spend and that we're going to get a swing. Beryl, I want to talk to you and, and get your view on, do you think diamond jewelry sales just increased because spend got diverted away from experiences? Like, what do you truly believe about this? Is this a temporary boost? It's, it's a multitude of things that happened. Uh, Stephen's point on how people felt, you know, in, is, is 100 percent accurate. You know, relationships, when you went to commemorate a relationship, I mean, what do you do it with? You do it with something luxury. You started then the other piece of it, you start to tick that down. You couldn't take your family on a cruise. You couldn't take your significant other on a cruise. You couldn't could hardly go out for dinner or you start to tick down there weren't things that you could do and <clears throat> demand unquestionably moved from uh, over to goods versus services there's no question we benefited from that because the options became different so how much is one versus the other it's really hard to say and, and what's going to endure in it it's a combination of it all yeah. no thanks thanks a lot for that and what I wanted to ask you is, let's look at the issue of sustainability that Stevens put on the table, the idea that people look at the world impact of what they, what they buy. 
What's your take on sustainability? Is it really part of your conversation with consumers? To a minimal degree at this point, I think it will become over years more important. The Gen Z customer who is age 10, they're not coming into the store too often, to age 25, they ask the questions. They're, they're where the questions come from or any concerns come from. Obviously, as time goes on, that generation you know, is going to move into uh, the age of our core consumers, and it, it will become more important. But first and foremost, we don't really sell diamonds. We really sell aspiration and romance. That's what our product is. That's what it symbolizes. That's what makes somebody go buy a diamond, not because of the way it came out of the ground or didn't come out of the ground. That may be a secondary decision-making factor or a third factor in the decision, depending on who the individual is. And it shouldn't be ignored. It is important. It's important for the world that we all do the right thing. But we can, I hope that as an industry, we do not make that so important that that becomes our primary message versus aspiration and romance. If we lose the diamond dream, we have lost it all. I've got a, quite a lot of questions. Me? Okay. I put a second mic next to, next to Beryl because she, I think she's trying to look at me, which I typically don't understand, but it's, it's good. You can look at me, Beryl. That's <laughs> all right. I'll look at you, Stephen. You've now got a choice. I, I've got a lot of questions to ask you about this, Beryl, from a retailer perspective. Okay. Shamlal, I want to check in with to you. look at the person talking to you, but we'll do I want to quickly check in with you. From an Indian consumer perspective, how relevant is sustainability in terms of your conversations with your customers? on the ground? Uh, sustainability has been the key word or dominating many of the conversation during many industries as well as among consumers. But the reality is a small fraction of our consumers really value sustainability in our part of the world. It's maybe like, you know, lack of communication, lack of marketing, that may be the reason. Uh, but going forward, I believe, it is going to be a prominent decision-making factors, especially among millennials and Gen Z, and also for many other partnerships and associations. But it hasn't stopped us doing many, uh, you know, sustainable activities like conflict-free, responsible sourcing, zero emission factories, sustainable packaging, uh, labor-friendly, you know, employments. A small section of our younger audience still talk about sustainability because of their exposure with other retail brands. In the future, it is going to be a major decision factor when they choose the brand or the product. Beryl, I want to come back to you, and Stephen, I've got some questions for you as well. Because you mentioned a couple of things. You talked about the younger consumer. You talked about aspiration and romance. Do you think that there is a danger that we put too much emphasis on sustainability in diamond marketing and divert away from the emotional equity, or the traditional emotional equity, or do you see them operating side by side? I think there is a definite danger that we go too far towards sustainability at the sacrifice of emotion. I think we are today not, today the retailer speaks for the industry to the consumer the industry used to, you know, in the day, Stephen, you know, when you ran the marketing programs and they were outstanding at De Beers, the industry spoke to the consumer and created an overarching umbrella of demand. That's already lacking, which, which hurts significantly. Mm. If we lose what little bit we still have and we focus too much and make sustainability the first message, I think we jeopardize ourselves. In no way am I saying sustainability is not important, and no way am I saying that all of us and how we run our, our companies and our businesses should not pay attention to it and do the right thing. It's putting the, it in the right priority order for where we are and where we're going in the foreseeable future. Is there a case to argue, Stephen, that sustainability, and, and you can respond to what Beryl said as well as part of this question, but is there a danger that when we look at sustainability, it's just something that consumers expect. They want that TikTok. They want to see that there's a positive impact. But what moves them to buy something isn't the sustainability narrative in itself. 
but are there more classical emotional ba uh, drivers such as aspiration now, and romance? I'm, I mean, I think this isn't even a question. I agree 100% with what Beryl says. Mm. You have to separate what are motivators, what motivates someone to do something, from what creates, I guess call it a cultural acceptance or a cultural um, uh, permission to do something. And sustainability doesn't a motivator to buy a diamond. That's not why I'm going to go buy one. You know, what motivates me to buy a diamond is what I wanted to say to the person I give it to or what I wanted to say about me. And, you know, we could get into the complex motivations. Diamond is a complex product that targets people on many different levels. It's not one dimensional. You know, we talk about the, 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 the ultimate commitment and symbol uh, of love, and that is a powerful differentiator, motivator, and we're so fortunate because, you know, if there's one thing that I think is eternal in the world is love and commitment. It's not going away, and if we can own that, you know, we must seek to do that. And I think we've seen new, think new opportunities emerge, which I'm sure we'll get into, uh, which I think if we tap creates huge opportunity. But, but let's just, again, maybe I wasn't so clear about this sustainability. To me, it's about status. That's what I want to say. It's emotion. It's about status. It's not about detailed technical uh, uh, understanding of sustainability or even whether deep down I really care or not. But I do care about status. And let me Stephen, give you I need to quickly ask you a question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. You know, De Beers has put a lot of effort and a lot of a lot of uh, time and resource behind sustainability issues. And a lot of what comes back out are quite factual and rational communications. How, first of all, why did you do that? And second of all, how do you make the leap from those quite detail-oriented reports to the emotional equity you're talking about? Yeah, and, you, and one thing about the, the world of, uh, and here, here's where I think we have to do this. Because I think that if you're not, if you don't have your product category, positioned against these issues, in the long run, you're gonna lose consumers from your category. Um, so you need to do it, but don't confuse that with a motivation to buy. They're different, they're two different, uh, uh, they're two different things. And in this world of, of, of you know, to me, uh, sustainability, I don't even really like the word. To me, the better phrase is people and planet. Because in our world, it's about balancing the impact on people and the improvement of people's lives and protecting the planet. And we've got to balance those two, uh, those, those, those two issues because a planet with, with you know, people in desperate state ain't any better than people in great state on your planet. You have to balance it. And, and you can't fake that. That has to be real and, and it's not marketing. Huh? If you market that, you will be shown up in time. So it has to be authentic. And to be authentic, you have to start with the actual programs in place, the details, the fact base that's real. And it's one of the reasons why I encourage you know, everybody in this industry to get involved in something like the RJC, because it helps you, wherever you are, to start to develop your, your, your fact base. But that's not enough. That, takes, you know, that will bring your influences with you. But the consumers, not, they need it really simple. We're going to come back to this. It's very important, the issue of sustainability. Let's park this for a moment. Shamlal, I want to bring you into the picture and Look, change topic. Yeah, I just on, want to add yeah, what on, Mr. Sorry. Stephen said. There's a lack of visibility of marketing initiatives towards us in our country, in, in some part of the world, even in UAE. It should be you know, marketed well. Do you think this is a general problem in India, just before we change topics, that Beryl mentioned the lack of category marketing? You know, the idea that De Beers used to do category marketing on behalf of the whole sector. Obviously, De Beers' position changed and, and marketing evolved with it. But did India get hurt by lack of category marketing? Or did India prosper despite the lack of category marketing that we saw historically? I didn't get the answer the question well. How do you think the lack of category marketing that De Beers did historically, how do you feel that impacted the Indian market? Did you feel that there was a loss, a gap in marketing that needed to be done in driving culture? Uh, 
Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> We're going to come back to category marketing because it's a really interesting topic. Let's just talk about this omni-channel development that we've talked about. So the sure. idea of physical stores and yeah. digital presence. When you look at the Indian setup, how important is that online component, Shamlal, in your, in your business? That's an interesting question, actually. Uh, across organizations and individuals, the digital transformation is happening at a fast pace, especially after COVID. At the moment, there's only small percentage, close to one percentage of our sales happens through e-commerce. But the digitally influenced to sale is going to be 30 percentage. That's what we're realizing. Due to its convenience, people explore or discover about the brand and the product at digital platform. They come to offline store for their final purchase. So to give in the true omni-channel experience for the future customers is very important. So we are investing heavily in infrastructure, people, and technology to be in pioneer in this industry. We call it as uh, uh, millennials and Gen Z's digital natives. The kind of exposure they have in the digital space it is very important to give because most of this product they buy for for some celebration or an occasion. So we want to give the same type of celebratory experience when they do even shop online. Can I just quickly cut to you, Beryl, then? Helzberg was one of the more traditional stores in terms of these days you could call it bricks and mortar. In the old days, they called it bricks and mortar. What role has digital played for you as a retailer? Well, you know, as it happened for ever, everyone, when COVID hit, you know, the digital business exploded. Di the digital business is the future. It's not just selling off of the internet. I mean, that is a, a large component of it. But the internet site is the front door to the store. I mean, it's where the consumer goes to research, they go to learn, they go to compare. Uh, the, the vast, well, I, I don't want to say the vast majority, but a very large percentage of consumers who come in and shop bridal with us have shopped it on the internet first. They've gone through and they've looked. I have to look at Stephen. Okay, sorry. <laughs> They're getting doubled up. <laughs> I wanted, to, I wanted to give you the option. My husband would never believe I couldn't be heard. He would never believe that. <laughs> <laughs> so to, to back up for a second, we the digital business exploded when um, when COVID started to happen. But it's bigger, way bigger than just selling online. It interrelates with all of the marketing. The internet is the front door of the store. It's where the consumer goes first to research, particularly in the world of bridal, which is so critical to all of us. That's where they learn. That's where they compare. They come in with their questions. They come in with sheets of information that they've printed off. So your website has to be a friendly information center. It has to be a store. You know, it, it has multiple functions. And how the social channels fit into that is also critically important for sophisticated marketing. You know, and you could sum it all up you know, with the new king of retail is data. You know, data is the most important thing we can all learn and mine and, and understand how to use, and we're using it all through the, the social channel. So it's, it's way bigger than just an internet site. Beryl, a quick question on this. Why do you think, and I know that you can't really comment on other people's strategies, but why do you think a retailer like Blue Nile set up physical showrooms and plans to open more? I can only guess because they haven't called and chatted with me about it, but <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, I'm sure, looking to you know, expand their exposure, broaden their, their marketing base, you know, and the, a, the consumer does, particularly for that kind of a product, want some place to look and feel. You know, so you know, they expand their market base that way, and they expand their brand, you know, and they still you know, have their own twist to it. So one of the things that Beryl has mentioned, Stephen, is the important role that retailers played in educating the consumer. So compared to a lot of other products, consumers may come into a diamond store not really knowing 100% what they want to buy beyond the idea that they want to buy a diamond or some sort of engagement ring. And we're going to come back to your fifth C later on, Beryl. The idea here is, what challenges does Omnichannel create 
as we move more digital, what does it mean for the effectiveness of retail? Yeah, challenge, I think, opportunity. I mean, if, if I look through the COVID, you know, what do, what do I think in terms of driving sales of diamond jewelry that uh, happened during the COVID period that's permanent? And we've been, in some ways, lucky to have the, the, the need to build. We built an enormous industry muscle that we did not have prior in, uh, uh, in the whole digital marketing and e-commerce. Uh, as an industry, we were laggards compared to uh, luxury goods, but broadly. And we were forced to act, uh, as Beryl said, in COVID and probably I can imagine how the speed with which you had to do it must have been remarkable. But that's now permanent. If you look at the MasterCard data on, on uh, e-commerce sales in the US, you know, I take all data with a grain of salt, but we saw the big bounce in e-com when the stores shut, no surprise there. But then when the stores reopened, we saw the, the sales come back in the stores, but not decline in the e-com. And so we built a my argument is we built a permanently higher level of sales now by engaging in that space where our competitors were and we weren't before. And that's hugely, that's a hugely uh, positive. Is that essential? I mean, you don't have to tell anyone in this room who has a 23-year-old child, I have th three in the 20s, don't read a newspaper, never bought a magazine, never watch television unless it's Premier League football. The only thing they watch is sports live. Nothing else. Everything else they access through their laptop or their, or their phone. Now, they're not really our customers yet. But in a decade, that's our customer. And we, if we don't have these skills, we're going to get clobbered. Just to keep the balance here, Shamlal, did you want to say something about this? Yeah, I completely agree with Mr. Stephen. So the digital influence stain, what we are seeing is like there's a tremendous shift towards that. 30 to 50% sale will happen through digitally influenced. They do their research, they do their, you know, uh, exploration through offline, online and they come to offline. So I completely agree with you. Do you think like if we look at some of these online retailers and you can name some of these, but the big ones, we know what we're talking about and people go through databases, they pick their diamonds, and then they pick the settings. Do you think that there's a risk that we're actually commoditizing diamonds by selling online like this? Do you feel it adds the same degree of value, Beryl, as it would if people went into a store, got the education, informed education, and made choices that way? I, I think the diamond thieves, which you find when most people sites, I mean, that's, I think the diamond thieves do commoditize to a, to a certain degree. I think they really lend them, I think they target the male audience more than the female audience. The, 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 male, the male audience will tend to be more black and white technical in, in how they approach it, and the female will tend to be far more emotional. So the approaches and the thinking are different. I think there is the beginnings of a trend to narrow down you know, and narrow in those enormous feeds you know, of diamonds. You have to remember, Nish, it's a big, this is a big market with multiple segments. So a lot of the time when we talk about, uh, as Beryl is describing, to me that's a very bridal, huh? where you go on, you have the rational man thinking about the rational fact, the qualities, the four C's, and you know, that's an important segment, but actually, what we miss out there is if you ask me, what's the next big diamond market? If you asked me 20 years ago, I would have said China or India. I now say women self-purchase is the biggest mark growth market we have. Mm. And that's going to operate on completely different dynamics because that's where design is important, luxury is important, the environment in which they buy all, is all part mm. of that. It's a completely different purchase process from buying you know, a solitaire. So it's important we segment this market and then develop you know, the approaches that are required, which are completely different, to really develop it to its full potential. So I mean, I question, uh, Shamlal, I've got a question for you in a moment, but I just want to put on the table, the worry could be something like this. We rely on retailers to play, the physical stores to play the education role. 
in getting people over the line, in understanding what they want, understanding the magic of diamonds, understanding the emotional value of diamonds. As we shift to an omni-channel experience and a bigger chunk of that goes into di digital, right? We, could we have a risk that consumers will start looking this just looking at diamonds through the four C's and, and trying to attribute that way. How do we make up that deficit? That would be the kind of question maybe we can come up to. But, but Shamlal, I've got a different question for you. You, as a retailer, transitioned from gold to diamonds. And in the bridal category, people in India bought gold to, as almost like an investment, a safe haven store of wealth. Are people buying diamonds in India for the same reason that they're buying gold in your experience? Yeah. Uh, I have a point, like Mr. Stephen also said. There are a lot of new segment of consumer comes to diamond category today, especially on anniversaries. If it is a milestone anniversary, whether it is 5th, 3rd, 10th, 3rd, 25th anniversaries, people prefer to buy bigger, you know, solitaire diamonds for engagement and proposal ring. Proposal is a new uh, trend in India. During the proposal, you know, people prefer to give solitaire diamonds, which was not there before. Even in Valentine's Day, even the special locations like Mother's Day, Arab Mother's Day, it's one of the biggest market in GCC. So all these categories now, people prefer to give diamond as the most preferred gift articles. Because diamond is not, not just an object today. It's not just a piece of carbon today. It simplifies many other things, commitment, new beginning, you know, celebrating success. So the perceived value is much higher than the giving a product or a jewelry. So there's a tremendous shift happening towards gold to diamonds, and, and which is a, one of the biggest market. I heard uh, Mr. Bruce talking about China and US. I think India is going to be one of the biggest market for Polish diamond jewelry. Let's, I mean, it's an interesting question that people bought gold for a store of value and you're saying that people's purchasing motivations are changing as they go into diamonds, and there's more of an emotional angle to why people buy things. One of the things that Stephen said had an emotional angle earlier is sustainability. So let's just quickly go back to that. And in particular, it's relationship with lab-grown diamonds. One of the things that st struck some of us is that De Beers intensified its move towards building that sustainability narrative as lab-grown diamonds came onto the scene. Stephen, to what extent is that true? To what extent did you, as an organization, build a sustainability narrative, highlight the good work that natural diamonds are doing as a response to a lab-grown position? No, in reality, well in advance of that. And I think the, the, the conclusion that we drew, and um, you know, I'd be interested in what everyone thinks, but the conclusion that we drew was that, that, and it's I think true of particularly of luxury goods. It's not a diamond specific issue. It's a luxury good issue. You know, by definition, you don't need a luxury good. Now, I might argue that actually to be human, you know, we fill a deep need of the soul. And that's as important to living. So I often argue about whether it's, you know, uh, uh, really discretionary or whether you need that. But nonetheless, luxury goods are not something you know, that you need in order to eat, to heat your home, or to transport yourself around. So what do, how will the world look at luxury goods? And if you take the view that, that the world will define product categories by things like how they impact in a climate change world, or how they benefit, you know, to me the, two, the three big issues, climate change, uh, inequality, uh, both geographic and within society, and to me then uh, diversity, uh, and for particularly for De Beers gender diversity. So those are three big issues. Um, and I think the world will view brands for sure, but I think in time categories by how they line up against those three, uh, those three measures. And so the De Beers view is that we need to get well ahead of this. And if you actually look at when we started those programs, you know, they were a decade ago. And it takes time to do these things well. Uh, you have to, you know, you need to develop a, pl a plan and a program and start executing. Um, you know, to be, for De Beers to be climate neutral by 2030, that's a 10-year mission from when we, 
uh, we, you know, we kicked it off. But we felt that if we weren't there 10 years from now, we could have a big problem. Stephen, to ask a more pointed question, if we look at the emotional value of uh, the emotional aspects of sustainability, so leaving kind of the rational arguments to one side, how do you think consumers see lab-grown and natural in terms of the emotional sustainability narrative today? Yeah, I think that it depends what you mean by emotional. I would say surface versus reality. You know, the reality, as we know, is very complex, this question. Uh, in, in a large part because the lab-grown business is evolving and the main production of lab-grown diamonds is going to come uh, from today, probably from India and in the future from China. China has a huge uh, uh, capacity from the industrial sector uh, to produce lab-grown diamonds. And I can tell you, not renewable energy sources in either India or China. So there is the reality of the fact that uh, there's a huge energy consumption that will describe the vast majority, not all of them, there are those which are renewable driven, but the vast majority of the category. But that I don't think is the perception today. And so the perception, and maybe it's a, just like an intuitive thing, well it must be better than digging a hole in the ground. Um, and so I think that that for the natural industry is a task we have to educate not about lab-grown, it's their business, but to educate about the positive impact of natural. And that's what I am interested in because I think that uh, the story, you know, this, this combination of people and planet, this story that the natural industry can tell is very compelling. To me, it's not about telling, it's not us and them. It's much more important that it is about the natural case, about us making sure that we're telling a story that then matches the aspirations and values and, in effect, the status that consumers want to project. And if we do that, we'll be fine. So I think, Beryl, let's look at your experience. You, Helzberg as a business was an early mover in lab-grown diamonds. What was your thinking in offering lab-grown diamonds to consumers at that moment? Well, we looked at it, you know, and can you, can you hear me? I mean, okay, can you hear me? When we looked at lab, you know, and we didn't look at it one day and jump into it the next. You know, we looked, we did our homework and our research and, and talked about it a lot and made the decision that this was a viable product category. It would probably work, no guarantees, you know, and that we needed to learn, you know, and test it and see what happened. and tweak the test and, and go from there and ultimately see what the consumer tells us. And it took a tremendous amount of training, you know, as well, because the front line of the sales associate, they had to learn. And today you offer, and have continued to offer lab-grown next to natural. We offer lab-grown next to natural. We let the consumer tell us how far to go with it, you know, and where to go with it. So, you know, an inch at a time, it's, it's gotten bigger. I personally believe it has expanded the total business. When, you, when a consumer comes into a store, to what extent do they know they want to buy lab-grown or a natural diamond going in? To what extent is store education the crucial variable in molding what the consumer wants or discovering what the consumer wants? The store education is critical to it. You know, they come in with moderate knowledge that they think they know something they really don't. You know, both whether it's mind or lab, you know, whatever they've read on the internet, you know, they ask questions. It, it's the store education on both products side by side where they make a decision. And why do consumers buy lab-grown diamonds? It's unquestionably a value proposition. You know, it's the value for their money, what the product looks like, you know, and price quality value. I mean, that's really what it is. They're putting one next to the other and the visual difference is, is just enormous. So when a consumer comes in, they wanna buy, let's say a bridal, a diamond engagement ring. They, they will consider lab-grown and natural diamonds as, as alternative approaches to achieving the goal of mm -hmm. getting their engagement ring. Okay. Uh, 
Are there any other segments? So you've talked about bridal a little bit. Are there any other segments where you're seeing lab-grown diamonds grow particularly? We actually started, we, we did test loose stones probably nine years ago. We were way, way, way early, and, and that didn't materialize. When we went back into the business, we started with fashion. Intuitively, that made the most sense to us. It has not turned out that way. You know, the, the fashion business, personally, I think, has a lot more potential than where we are today for a whole variety of reasons, uh, you know, some of which is just the pricing of smalls and what's happening in the marketplace. Uh, but as we tested bridal product, it way, outperform way outperformed anything in our wildest imagination, way outperformed fashion. So are you seeing just, I, I believe this is what you're saying, but I don't want to lead it. Are you saying that can, there are, there's a category of consumers? So you've said two things. One, that you believe LabGrown will just grow the overall market, that these two products together will grow the whole space. But you're also saying that some consumers will buy LabGrown diamonds instead of natural diamonds when making, say, a bridal choice. Yes, they will. But I, I do believe that both can live together very nicely how they're going to actually settle into each other, there's a million different factors too, and time is going to tell. And I, I think there is a market for lab, and there is a market for mind, and there's a place where they intersect. Uh, you know, and the biggest piece of that, and you know, we sell, my company, we sell to the moderate consumer, to the upper end of the middle, the lower end of the upper, the broad base is our customer. We're not Tiffany, we're not Cartier. You know, so we have a a different kind of a customer. You know, to that customer, what's happening is they're looking at, it's almost like the one carat, the new one carat mine diamond has become a two carat lab. You know, and without divulging specific numbers, I can tell you that in 2021, we sold in units 50 times more two carat labs than we sold two carat mines. So, even if you want to think I sold 10 Mindstones, which I sold a lot more than that, I still sold 50 labs, 500 labs. So, you know, it's very significant in, in what's happening. And that customer took the average ticket up with it, where they would have been a four to $6,000 customer, they came, became a seven to $9,000 customer because the difference, you know, is enormous. So I think when you're, you, when you're selling, you know, a SI2, an I1 kind of a product in an H HK, HI, HI color, and you're comparing it to a lab, the price difference can be absorbed, you know, and the visual difference is enormous. You know, if we were showing, if we were a higher end, you know, and we were in a VS kind of product, then the comparison is going to come a price conversation and a different mentality customer. And, where that would settle in, you know, I'm, I'm really not sure. Shamlal, I want to ask you about the Indian market. Some people believe that the US, what happens in the US eventually happens in other markets. Not everybody believes that, but some people do. What do you expect? Do you think what's happening in the US will eventually happen in India, or do you think it's just a totally different environment? Uh, as far as Malabar, we are a retailer. So whenever we see a demand for uh, lab grown, so whatever opportunity makes business sense, we'll definitely embrace lab grown, but maybe under the separate brand name. Uh, there are a few factors actually holding back to go into this lab grown. First of all, price, which is going down. As a policy, whatever we sell, it has to be value appreciating gift articles. That is one of our tagline. So we, we, we are worried about the buyback, and whatever we sell today, we give cash buyback and exchange. So we are still figuring out how will we manage those risks. And in India, it is not just an object I like I mentioned. There are a lot of other values attached to natural diamonds. So maybe a different category, a different set of audience, maybe for millennials and Gen Z, because this talks about emphasize on uh, eco-friendly. Uh, you know, low environmental impact, low price point, 
where in natural diamonds they talk about purity, rare, preciousness. So it has to be to different set of audience with to set, uh, different set of marketing strategy. But there is a market for both. Both will coexist. Rather than competing each other, it will definitely complement each other. As a category, diamond will grow. It will get more share from maybe other category, like, sorry to say, Swarovski or other products. Yeah. But I don't think it's not a competition for natural diamonds. I mean, I think the, the kind of argument goes, and we don't know if this is actually the way it will play, but just to play devil's advocate, the argument goes that the difference between cubic zircona and mosinite and, and all of these substitutes and lab-grown is that lab-grown diamonds can call themselves diamonds, right, and therefore can leverage the marketing equity that diamonds have built over a period of time. That's the potential challenge, and I think what Beryl is saying is that, they're, that for sure these are going to coexist. There'll be a distinct market for lab-grown, there'll be a distinct market for natural, but there'll also be this point of inter intersection as well, where both products are in play at the same time and consumers choose between one and another. The, the question would be, Shamlal, just for you to, to think about for a moment is, in the Indian environment, how do you see that playing out? But in the, before I come to you again, Stephen, what is your view on all of this? What research has De Beers done in why consumers would buy a lab-grown diamond or an actual diamond? What's the distinctive choice? Yeah, as diamonds? you know, we've got a lab-grown brand. So, um, uh, you know, we believe that there is uh, opportunity and that this, uh, you know, will be a, a category that grows. So, but I think we have to step back and say we're in a, we're still in the t sort of twilight zone of, of uh, transition. Interestingly, when I was uh, here, what was it, 2019, on the panel, different hotel, same city, I think, uh, you know, I was challenged by, is this the end of the natural diamond world? by, uh, by uh, one of the participants opposite uh, from the lab-grown world. And, um, and where are we now? In America, where lab-grown is the strongest, we've just had the strongest natural diamond sales in history in America. Um, the growth, the incremental growth in natural diamond sales in America, forget the base, just the growth, is three to four times the size of the entire lab-grown business. So, you know, if that's a lesson that we're both going to be around, I think... That's in dollar terms, not in percentage. In dollars, terms, yeah. yeah. So we should take confidence that, uh, that there, are, there are plenty of consumers. Why I say we're in the transition, and, and we have to wait, I think, three or four, or maybe five years until we see where this lands, is that I'm seeing an increasing divergence. And to me, part of the natural diamond promise is based on an inherent rarity. There only is what the world made a billion years ago. They're there. Uh, uh, there is an inherent rarity that drives an enduring value. And, you know, it's good that over the last 15 uh, months to see diamond prices rising again, because I think yes. that they need to be permanently so. Gradually, I hope. <laughs> Not to, I don't like spikes, but that's part of the story. And I think when I, I said when I was here in 2019 that that that's the challenge of the lab grown. It does not have uh, a natural rarity. So we've seen significant increases in production of lab grown. And if I compare it to when I was here in 2019, uh, wholesale prices down 60%, varies a little bit by size, but 60% decline. The discount to natural in 2019 was about 20 to 30% for a similar size and quality. It's now somewhere between 70 and 80% at wholesale. The on, if you track online, they're coming down roughly in line with wholesale. I think retail's done a bit better at holding the, 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 the price line, but it's inherently going to continue. It's like an economic fact that as production increases, the costs of productions are falling. And, you know, without disclosing anything confidential, you know, Lightbox can can make a one carat for three or four hundred dollars. I think that there's so um, you know it, it, it'll inherently continue to diverge. That doesn't mean it's not a yeah. it doesn't have a, a you know a role to play in the jewelry world. And I agree with Beryl that I think 
To me, it's about how one markets it. Markets it in the right way, I think we're going to see an expanded category. I and think that's, that's, good, that's good for all, for all players in our business. We need you know, areas of expansion. We need to talk about this and unpick this. And uh, obviously, everybody in the audience, I want you to know we are running over. We started the conference a bit late. But from our perspective, there seems to be quite a lot to unpick. We'll try to wrap up in the next half hour but, and not go beyond that. Stephen, I've got a lot of questions for you on this, right? Let's try to pick them off one by one. Uh, and let's just, you mentioned Lightbox. You launched Lightbox a couple of years ago. It was at an earlier stage in this lab-grown cycle. I guess the objective at that point was to create the differentiation, the differential positioning between lab-grown and natural. What sort of impact do you think Lightbox has now had on the market? Yeah, it's probably better to ask that question to, to Lightbox's competitors rather than me. I mean, I think the core role Lightbox wanted to, to play is we do think that there is an incremental opportunity for De Beers in this, in this sector. And to me, the key thing is around, you know, what are the advantages of lab grown? It means we can, we can produce these at very low cost. And I can tell you, producing a, you know, recovering a natural one carat diamond, sometimes people for, forget that the, the natural one carat diamond, the, the cost of recovering that is subsidized by all the small diamonds that we get with it. You know, if we were only recovering one carat diamonds from the, from the world, it would be like $100,000 plus for every one carat that comes out. But because we get all the other small ones that we sell, we can lower, we can lower that, that, that cost. So that's not what happens to us in the lab grow. We can create a very low cost, what I think is a very appealing product to, to the eye. And that could create opportunity for us to open segments that we could never do with natural. So that's what, what you know, is driving us. What impact it, has it had? I think, it's, I, I think it's had a significant impact on the wholesale price because it's visible huh, what these products should cost. And um, I suspect Beryl's probably used that to drive very good deals with her suppliers because that's the way she is. So, Beryl, uh, what does that mean for you? <laughs> what, what impact did Lightbox have? What difference did it make? It should just, the reality is when we sell in a, in a solitaire product, a mine solitaire product, studs and pendants, engagement rings, not so much bridal because it has a lot of melee on it, but a solitaire product, the margin to, to us as a retailer is less than my SG&A. So if I didn't have a whole lot of other things to sell, gold product and color stones to offset, I couldn't open my doors on mine product. Lab Diamonds has given us you know, an opportunity, and I believe it's given the vendor community an opportunity to make you know, a nice margin you know, on that product. And you know, yes, we have experienced pricing coming down, you know, to varying degrees and varying on sizes, you know, Stephen, as you said. But we have not experienced, and I hope we don't experience, and we're certainly not going to experience it at Hellsburg, the retailer sinking to the lowest common denominator, you know, which historically we've all been pretty good at. You know, and it's incumbent upon the industry to not do that. You know, and along with that, you know, if if doing a little bit of homework you know, on, so I may be I'm in a range of right, I believe, to just fill the pipeline that's out there in the world on lab diamonds, if that were to happen, would take something like 25 million carats of rough, which doesn't exist, you know, and we're a long way from that happening. So as that slowly happens over time, and I'm sure it will, this business will sort itself out further you know, and it'll all find a comfort zone, and hopefully, you know, the industry will be respectful of it. Uh, the bottom line is the customer has accepted the product. They've accepted it in bridal. They've accepted it in fashion. You know, and those of us who do not Uberize our business will be Kodak'd. Big statement. Is the challenge, then, when we really look at this, that lab-grown and natural aren't really sufficiently differentiated? They're described using the same four C's, you can have the exact same cert. 
you can set them in the same jewelry. Uh, you can describe them both as diamonds. You know, what do you think? Do you think that's the core, a core issue and allows lab-grown diamonds and, and natural to compete on what feels like a more even footing? Yeah, yes, because they are both, they're the same, but they're different. You know, and the retailer has to be honest, you know, and accurate in how they just describe and, and, and train to both of those things, and the customer is gonna make their decision, you know, based on their own emotion. You know, a lab diamond does not say I love you any less than a mine diamond, and a mine diamond doesn't say I love you any more than a lab diamond. I think that, you know, just a couple of points here, and then I want Stephen to kind of respond to all of this. So a couple of points have been made, and they can be made on both sides of the fence. Diamonds are rare. By any way you mention, and you look at the Earth's crust, and you look at this, they're a scarce product, they're rare, they're finite. We know that that alone isn't gonna win the day, because certain gemstones are more rare than diamonds, but are worth less. We know coal is a finite product, but that doesn't make it incredibly valuable. So we know that there are all these things, and in the end, it's gonna be about the emotion-based marketing combined with the other attributes that we're talking about, like rarity, and, and we've, we've seen throughout history that when products become more commonplace, uh, like, so here are the challenges that we've got a product that some people view as just a diamond, like, like a natural diamond. Stephen, the question for you, and I, I believe this is one of the biggest questions on, on today's panel, is do you think there's enough tangible differentiation between the way a natural product is presented at a retail counter compared to a lab-grown in a way that the natural should get a significant premium over the lab-grown? So it's consumer tangible differentiation. I don't even like the question premium. I don't know what that, you're equating these two things as the same. Or it's a more valuable and product. I, yeah, well it is. Yeah. Because it's far more costly to bring to the world. It is a more valuable product. And I think this is where I think that we're in this, we're in this particular phase in the development. We won't really know for another five to 10 years. And I could put forward different scenarios for what that would look like. But to me, the fundamental thing is that the laws of economics here are, are going to, at some point, find their way to the world. And with, you know, particularly with the Chinese production gearing up. And, you know, we've seen this in the industrial synthetic business, of which De Beers is a big player. We've seen the, you know, the cost of industrial grit go from 30 to 20 to 10 to 3 to $1 a carat because the Chinese have this enormous capacity and this ability to refine the technology and completely and significantly reduce the cost. You know, inherently, you can get at wholesale lab-grown diamond for $600 of good quality. So for how long are you going to be able to sell it for $6,000? We'll see. My own view is that, that the divergence in price will continue. Now, for some people, that's not important, because what does it look like? I'm happy. But those people probably couldn't afford to buy one carat natural in five years either. So that's where I think this substitution is very tricky. You know, would they buy a, a natural diamond? Maybe buy a smaller one? Would they buy something else? You know, it's very hard to say what's a, a substitute or not. We clearly see sub, some substitution, but how will that evolve, uh, you know, over the next five years? And that's really, to me, this enduring value is important, and it's hard to explain. And I think it will take time to, to, to land with consumers. Because I'm sure Barra will say, we see the same from our research, that people say, I'm buying the engagement ring. It's not an investment. I'm not going to sell it. You know? So if the price comes down a bit, well, I'm not so worried because it looks beautiful on my finger. But it's, you need to be able to leap forward. Let me give you one example. I know I don't want to use too much time. I'm sorry. But my, I had a, this interesting discussion just this week with my children about my watches. I'm a bit of a collector of watches. I've got three boys, and I said, you've got to work out who's going to get one. <laughs> who's going to get what? Can you work it out so there's not a big fight after, uh, after I've gone? And, um, and what they're really interested in is what's the value of that watch? Because they were trying to even out the value between the three of them. And 
and it made me think. Now, you know, I don't know what it costs to make a Rolex Daytona. I don't think it's probably what I pay. Huh? But, but why is it important to me is that whatever I paid for it, when I leave it to my child, I think it's going to be worth more. They think it's going to be worth more. And this same Daytona, if I could buy this 10 years from now for $500, I don't think my kid would want the Daytona. They'd want, they'd want something else. So what, you know, the long-term value has not played out. And we have to wait, you know, we've got to wait some time and, uh, I think, to get there. I think that I'm the least qualified to talk about marketing on this panel. I don't understand all the nuances. But it strikes me that there is a difficulty here. Definitely understand that on the cost side, like many other technology developments, the cost will go down and you'll be able to... And typically what tech providers do is that for the same price point, they offer you a better product, right? So over time, a laptop can cost the same amount of money as a headline price, but you get more stuff for your, for your money. So there is a, an issue around that. But the bigger side remains the marketing side, like what does it mean for people? And if people talk about investments or values, then we're moving into the idea that di people buy diamonds as, for some retained value, some investment value, and potentially not for the aspiration romance barrel that you were talking about. I think that, and I, I don't know how these elements coexist. I don't know if Shamlal, you can take a crack at this in the Indian market. On the one hand, there's emotions. On the other hand, there's the investment angle. What are consumers in your experience really looking for? Yeah, one of the key decision-making factor for uh, buying jewelry in India is investment value. So people prefer to have value appreciating to their investments. So that's been the major reason for investing heavily in gold. So diamonds also has been increasing price drastically. So I think uh, this is one of the reason I'm a bit worried what will be the price for uh, lab grown in the future. So this will be one of the key decision making factor value appreciation factor. Do you think, Beryl, that if lab-grown diamonds got very cheap, that they'd become less desirable to consumers? And do you think that would have a knock-on effect to natural diamonds, or do you think that would just stay as separate categories? I think that they would have to become, like CZs or Moissanite, before that would happen. It would have to be a way bigger difference you know, than it is today. And then I think it would just simply become a, another category. Hmm. That, that, is so f that is a long way you know, from playing out. And you know, you know, Steve, when you talk about watches, you've got the proverbial, you know, there's a huge Rolex business out there. There's also a huge previously owned Rolex business out there. They live together you know, without any great problem. Prices of diamonds through the years have gone up and they've gone down. I mean, the consumer is pretty much not even aware of it, <clears throat> as we all are understanding it on our side. Uh, you know, so it, it isn't like there isn't precedent in the industry, there isn't, like there isn't precedent in diamonds themselves of, of price fluctuation and how things change. I think, the, I think the question is at what point, and I don't know the answer, but I'll just ask the question. And, and, to, to me, the word, you know, it, it's not about financial value per se. It's about what's perceived as being something precious. And people use the expression precious and valuable. They, they go together. And, you know, if you, you have to back up. Why is a diamond, in the beginning, why did it become an engagement ring? Why? Because you did a lot of marketing. No. <laughs> uh, predates, predates me. <laughs> What we did is we democratized something that was already felt. And, and diamond was felt to be a precious thing, and as a result, could be used to mark what were precious and enduring values. So, you know, the line of diamond is forever means three, at the time of writing, we intended to be married forever. Didn't quite work out that way, but married forever, that was your promise. Um, and and we used to say eternally f elegant forever. So you could wear it your whole life and it would never go out of fashion. And third thing was it would be have enduring value, preciousness. And that's why it could, that's why 
um, it could signify something that you never intended to get rid of and intended to be part of your life forevermore. So what makes something precious? And you know, that, that's the question that I think we'll, and we don't know yet, we'll see in I five years Can what I the answer is. Sure, please. I feel so passionately about what I'm about to say. I've been in this industry for pushing 40 years. When the retailer is the one who is speaking for the category, that is not a positive thing. And the retailer, I can speak to the United States, is a fragmented community. There is really only one retailer who can afford to go out there in a great big way. We are so missing the overarching marketing of what you used to do you know, from the De Beers standpoint. If we lose that, we have lost everything. I mean, it, all the talking about price is irrelevant. It just, I took a quick look before this event on Instagram. I'm not a social media you know, guru by any stretch of the imagination. But I went on to, to Instagram just to see what the National um, Diamond Council, what kind of reach they're having. They have 83,000 83, followers. Jared has 83,000 followers. Zale and Kays have 250, 225,000 followers. Brilliant Earth has 750,000 followers. The message is not getting out there from this industry, and I think that is the greatest danger this industry faces. I, th I think the mind and lab. Yeah, I agree with Beryl, but to give some support to my colleagues at the NDC, you know, they now got far more resources coming both from De Beers and Al Rosa, as well as the other uh, producers, so they'll be, you know, towards a hundred million dollars, which is not what De Beers was historically, but it's not chicken feed either, uh, getting significant. They've got about 130 million unique visitors coming through their, their websites. They're building, agree with Beryl, still ways to go uh, in building social media, which is where all the impact now takes place with influences and social media. But I think they're, compared to three years ago or two years ago, you know, they're in a different space. It'll take a little time to see that in impact, but I'm much more optimistic. But I agree, what I agree with is that if we don't position the category, then we'll lose consumers. But I'll give you my last two cents, because I know we're running short on time. But again, I'm passionate on it. I'm thrilled that they're getting more money. I was thrilled to hear Bruce say this morning that De Beers is spending more money, although I, unfortunately I can't say I'm seeing it. But when National Diamond Council puts out their message. It was such a, it was so focused to a broad consumer at the high end and the low end when it was Three Stone and Journey and Pendant and all of those things. And when we focus too much on high fashion and we focus too much at the high end, we've, we've out aspirationed ourselves, you know, and we're not, we're defeating our purpose. Yeah, I think they're in the audience, so hopefully I'm they're I'm sorry listening. if you all want to kill me, but that's what I think. <laughs> I think that there's some, just in the interest of time, I actually think we could continue for another 20, 30 minutes and cover a lot of interesting topics. We are gonna have to wrap up quite soon. I think that it seems to me that a, it is clear that the going in position of lab-grown diamonds and natural is completely different. That story is origin-based and the magic around the product. On the other hand, some consumers are buying lab-grown instead of natural. The, the crucial ingredient is to what extent this can stay differentiated in the consumer's eyes. The, the back end of it, the cost feeds into it to some extent, but it's really what the consumer values. And if there is not enough differentiation, we could continue building diamond equity that serves both lab grown and natural. That would seem the potential risk. One question for you, Stephen, on this is we didn't talk about prestige jewelry houses. Do you see any signs or any belief that prestige jewelry houses will adopt lab-grown? How important is it that it stays the way it is now, that that is not a part of their, their kind of high diamond offer? Yeah, I think it's, it, again, I hate to speak for others, because who knows what people are, uh, are thinking. My sense at the, at, at the moment is that the enduring value of their product is so essential to their belief in what they're about. You know, if you're in the, 
if you're in the high-end luxury jewelry, you inherently think you're selling things of, of enduring and in reality raising value over time. That's fundamental. It doesn't matter if it's a diamond, you know, or the precious metals or the precious stones. So um, to, the, to the degree that that's their ethos, they'll want to stick there at least until they see where prices settle in this market. And we're some years, I think, away uh, from that. The key for us in the natural sector is to make sure that their sustainability story is so compelling that they're comfortable with a natural product. And, um, and, and, and to me, so far, you know, we haven't seen uh, any of them go, but you know, we'll see. Stephen, that was a penultimate question. The final question goes to Beryl. It looks like, and this is the last question, it looks like you're wearing a lot of diamonds <laughs> on you at the moment. <laughs> Dare I ask whether they're natural or lab grown? If you have to ask, that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> My little babies here are natural. <laughs> Thank you very much you. for your time. Thank you to the audience for having an immense amount of patience with this panel. I hope you found it interesting. I'm going to suggest that we all leave.